Okay, um, in this chapter, we're going to talk about energy. And uh, there are many forms of energy, and uh, we're going to talk about some of them in this, in, this, uh, in this chapter. The basic concept of energy is that it is a property of a system that enables it to do work. Um, anything that you do on an object uh, which causes it to move uh, will, in fact, require energy. And when that is occurs, the energy that of the object being pushed acquires a certain amount of energy. Uh, there are a few examples that we'll talk about, uh, and many others, but one of them is the example of uh, electromagnetic waves or uh, radiation from the sun that heats an object as it impinges on it. And this can occur even though the temperature of the, of the atmosphere is very low, the sun will create heating. So you notice that uh, a, even in the wintertime, a car that has been sitting out in the sun uh, is, is warmed up when you open the door and you, you go inside. The, uh, the, 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 the matter in the, the seats and the steering wheel have been heated up by the, the solar radiation. Uh, other examples include what we normally call mechanical energy, which means that if I raise an object, in this case, as the slide suggests, I raise a hammer so that it can do work when it strikes the ground and it can drive a stake into the ground. Um, another example of electric is electrical energy. A battery is a power source or an energy source that can push electrons through a wire. So anything that can do work on a system creates energy for that system. Now, the simplest way to describe what work does is, or, or dis describe the concept of energy, is to start with the concept of work. Uh, work and energy are synonymous in, in many cases, and um, the work done on an object um, in, involves a force that is applied to the object over a certain distance. Namely, uh, it is important that in order for work to be done, the object has to actually move. Um, the equation that describes the work is force times distance. So if I apply a force of one Newton to a, uh, a ball, a rolling ball on the billiard ball table, that um, over a distance of one meter, then I will create or will have done one newton meter of work on the object. Um, so that's the basic idea is that work is force times distance and the object has to actually move. Now two things occur when work is done. So there's the application of force and there's the distance over which that, that uh, object has moved. Now in this example a, uh, a, a person has is exerting a lot of force on the wall, and even though he um, does not, uh, even though he's, a, he's expending a lot of calories from his sweat and perspiration, uh, he has done no work on the wall. And the simple reason is that because the fact the wall has not moved, no work has been has been done. Um, now, one can also uh, uh, have a similar example of a heavy box on the floor, and if he does not apply enough force, then of course the box will not move, and even though he's exerting a force, if there is no movement of the box on the floor, then no work is done on that either. And um, the answer to the question will be obvious then from what we've just, we've just discussed. Now, in this example, we have uh, we we look at scenarios in which we have two loads of uh, of an object being raised and uh, or objects being raised, and the first load, let's say, weighs twenty pounds, and the second load weighs forty pounds. Then we can clearly see that uh, we have to apply twice as much force to raise the heavier object uh, up one story a flight of uh, one, one uh, uh, floor of the, uh, of the building then, uh, then requires to um, raise a half the amount of weight up uh, above, uh, one, one floor uh, in, within the building. So uh, if the weight of the object is doubled 
then the work done is also doubled, uh, assuming that it had those two different loads have been raised the same distance, uh, which in this case is one floor. So um, that's one example of, of work as force times distance. Um, uh, and the second one is that uh, to observe that if I were to raise the object from the ground up to the second floor, then I have done twice as much wor work um, in uh, lifting this the load uh, the the second load uh, as I would have by lifting the second load up one flight of store one flight of stairs. That is to say, if the object uh, weighs forty pounds, then lifting it up from the ground to the second floor will uh, require twice as much work as lifting it up only one floor above the ground. So this is again an example of work is force times distance. In this example, we have a weightlifter raising a barbell uh, from the ground. And as he does that, he does work on the barbell or the object that he's lifting. And if we take an example, by you can see here, it looks like uh, he's lifting a very heavy uh, amount of weight, which we would take as example. For example, let's suppose that it was about it was about 200 pounds of of weight that he's lifting. Now uh, we can calculate the work done uh, by multiplying the weight of the object times the distance over which that force has been applied. So he has to apply the force, an upward force, which is exactly equal to the weight of the object in order for it to move. So in this case, then, a 200-pound object would be about 900 newtons, or about four and a half times the, uh, uh, the, the weight of the object in, in pounds. Uh, given that it is a 900 newton uh, force being applied to lift it, and assuming that the weightlifter is uh, two meters high when he stretches his arm as the barbell is raised as high as possible, then the amount of work that he's done is 200 newtons times two meters or 1800 newton meters. Now because we use this unit so frequently we give a special name to the newton meter and we call it a joule. So a joule is the amount of work done in raising an object above the ground and uh, in this case, we would say he has done 1,800 joules of work uh, on the barbell. Now, in this slide, we're asked to consider what happens if the barbell is twice as heavy as the value that we just quoted, and uh, he's lifting it up the same distance, which is 2 meters. So uh, because of the fact that he has to apply twice as much force, to raise it up the same distance, then he has done twice as much work. So in this case, from the previous slide, we would say that he has done 3,600 joules of work to raise the barbell two meters above the ground. Another very useful concept uh, in calculating um, how um, machines or objects are propelled is to define what we call the unit of power. So what power is, it measures, is it, or what it, what it means is that it is a measure of how fast work is being done on an object. Um, as you see here in equation form, the power is the work done per unit time. So in the case here of the rocket, uh, there has to be a minimum force that, uh, of the exploding gases in the ignition chamber, 
which uh, is at least equal to the weight of the rocket, otherwise the explosion will not be sufficient for the rocket to leave the ground. But if that force uh, does exist with high enough uh, to, uh, to, to exceed the weight of the rocket, then the rocket begins to rise above the ground and it will accelerate as it, as, as it moves up. Now, uh, one way to achieve a faster acceleration is to apply twice as much force uh, uh, to the object uh, uh, per, per unit time. So, you, for example, if um, I apply the weight of the rocket uh, over a distance of, we'll say, 100 meters, then uh, I will have uh, just enough force for it to, uh, to leave the ground. But if I double that force over the same interval of time, then uh, the rocket will uh, accelerate much more rapidly. So the idea of power here is it's how the work done per unit time, or we say the rate at which work is being done. And because time is measured in seconds, uh, and work is measured in joules, the unit of power will be a joule per second. Uh, that also has a special name, and it is given the unit of watts. And we're all familiar with watts from our electrical appliances and our electricity bill, which are um, quantified in how many watts of power uh, are required or be used of electrical energy, which can also be expressed as joules per second. So we'll talk more about that in the slides to come. Now, two examples of power is one with a worker running up the flight of stairs versus one uh, walking up the flight of stairs. In both cases, they have raised their potential energy or the, the, you know, the potential energy of their body by an amount equal to the weight of their body times the height of the, of the uh, of, of the stairs or the height between the, the floors for which he is walking. Um, in the case where he is doing it more slowly, he does, uses less power. If the walker, worker runs up the flight of stairs, then he has raised his potential energy in a shorter amount of time and therefore has exerted more power. In this case, the power that is exerting is the power to his own body. The object that's being exerted upon is, in fact, his, the mass of his own body, and it is the weight of the body that is being raised up a flight of stairs in a shorter time. So um, he does the work more quickly, and that's, of course, the concept of power. Another example is one in which we have two engines, and we have one engine which is twice the power of another engine, for example, in a car, and the, the, the more powerful energy engine can do twice the work of the other engine in the uh, same amount of time. Um, so, or, or another way of saying it is that it can do the same work uh, on the car, the vehicle, which the engine is applying its power to, uh, in, half the, in half that time. So it's just basically an example of using the relation that power is equal to force times distance divided by time. Now this slide just reiterates what we have said previously. Power is the force times the distance divided by the time. It is the force applied to an object to move it a given distance in a given amount of time. And the unit for that is joule per second or uh, sometimes called the watt, which was named after the inventor of the steam engine, James Watt. Um, another way of seeing this is, you see in the third, uh, the, the, the third bullet point in the slide, is that I can think of it in terms of applying a force to an object. And if I apply one newton of force, which moves the object one meter, and I do that for a period of time that is equal to one second, then I have applied one watt of power to the object, uh, which of course will cause it to accelerate. Um, one side note, a final point I should say on the slide is that often we talk in units of kilowatts, which is uh, uh, the equivalent expression for a thousand watts. Uh, we use kilowatts more frequently, and so you'll see that in electrical applications, for example. Uh, we'll continue with the next slide. Uh, I think we will let you do your own checks on your uh, 
on the questions that follow in uh, the uh, self-check or what's called check your neighbor so you can answer the question yourself and um, and then we will resume uh, at the uh, after that after that question Now, in this slide, we're going to be talking about mechanical energy and um, the basic notion that or categories that we need to consider is that mechanical energy um, can be a property of the location or the height of an object above the ground. In that case, it is due to its position, such as when I lift a, a load of stones uh, up to flight of stairs. Or it can be mechanical energy can be in the form of kinetic energy, which is related to the speed of the object. In particular, if I drop the object after lifting it up a flight of stairs and I drop it out the window, uh, the it will acquire a velocity uh, that increases as it falls, and that velocity at any given time is related to its kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is another word for motion energy or energy due to the motion or the velocity or speed of a particle. Um, it is similar to momentum, but uh, not quite. Uh, momentum is mass times velocity. We'll learn slightly later that kinetic energy is one half the mass times the velocity squared of an object. So if I lift an object by two meters, it's going to gain a certain amount of potential energy. Uh, and then if I release it, that potential energy is converted back to kinetic energy as it falls or loses that potential energy. So as it falls two meters, uh, then to the ground, it will have gained a certain velocity when it hits the ground, but it will have lost all of its potential energy. And the story or the importance of this, it can be interpreted by saying that we have a conservation of, of total energy. So the total energy is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. And um, in any closed system, if one of those quantities uh, increases, uh, it will be at the expense of the other. So we say that the potential energy plus the kinetic energy is a constant of the motion uh, so this is also a good way to introduce the first, the second conservation principle, um, which is the conservation of energy. Now, in this slide, we see a few examples of potential energy, um, and one of them is we can we will d discuss later in the more thoroughly later in the course, which is uh, electrical potential energy. And the idea of electrical potential energy is that uh, a battery is a device that um, uh, is capable of applying a force to electrons in a wire. So it has a quantity we call stored energy, which is capable when connected to a circuit of converting that potential energy uh, or applying a force uh, onto a system of electrons in, in a wire, causing them to move. So the potential energy is the battery source, and uh, when that's connected to a, uh, a closed circuit, uh, we connect a wire between the positive and negative terminal of the battery, then we get kinetic energy, which is the flow of electrons. Another example is the stretched bow of an arrow right before it's released. 
So when we stretch the bow, we apply a, we create a certain potential energy by applying a force onto the bow while it's holding the arrow. And right before release, there is a stored energy. And that stored energy is potential energy because I've already done work on the system by pulling the string back. When I pull the string back, I have the stored energy. As soon as I let go, the arrow <laughs> takes off. And the force of the bow on the arrow causes it to accelerate. And that potential energy has now been um, transferred to the arrow, <coughs> excuse me, uh, causing it to accelerate and the arrow acquires a kinetic energy, which is the uh, transfer of the potential energy of the bow to the kinetic energy of the arrow. Um, the stretched rubber band of a slingshot works exactly the same way, and it is also capable of doing work when I release the band and the stone is allowed to accelerate with a velocity. The next two slides deal with the concept of potential energy applied to a gravitational field, which is what we all live in. We live in the gravitational field of the Earth. The Earth applies a force uh, of gravity uh, onto all objects. So if we raise them up and then release them, um, they will, first of all, gain potential energy when I raise them. And when I drop it, that potential energy changes back to kinetic energy. Uh, two examples are uh, an elevated reservoir uh, of water, such as what we have in Niagara Falls. So in this case, uh, we have a man-made source of, uh, or I say a nature of, not a man-made, but a, nat a natural source of potential energy where one body of water sits at a much higher elevation than the other body of water. And so therefore, um, when the water falls, uh, off of the cliff of the larger of the large body of water, uh, it creates a vertically falling stream, which is such as what you see in the pictures of Niagara Falls. And the falling water creates kinetic energy for the water drops or the water molecules. And so the speed of the water increases as it falls down. Um, this is a case of the potential energy being lost when the water is up at the higher level and as the water falls over the cliff, it gains kinetic energy but loses its potential energy. And when it hits the bottom where it lands, it has lost all of its, kinetic, all of its potential energy. Uh, and the kinetic energy uh, of the water eventually is stopped as well. But just before impact, it reaches its maximum kinetic energy or maximum velocity. A similar, a similar case occurs uh, with a sledgehammer. If I raise it above the ground, uh, we give it a, a certain potential energy. And when it falls under the influence of gravity, it can do work by driving a stake into the ground upon impact. So the, uh, the, the sledgehammer has had its potential energy raised when I lift it up. And when I let it come down, it, uh, that potential energy is tr translated into or converted into kinetic energy where it can do work. In this slide, uh, we're going to review uh, some of the concepts that we've already talked about, but still try to make them more uh, uh, easily understandable by reviewing them. So what we've talked about in the previous slides is potential energy that's created when I lift an object up a given distance. Uh, and in, in, in equation form, uh, we, we can quantify this potential energy by saying that it's equal to the force that I apply to it times the distance, which in this case, the force is equal to the mass times acceleration due to gravity, uh, which we learned earlier is mass times 10, where 10 is the approximate acceleration of any object under free uh, that th under any object under, under free fall. So the weight of the object is the mass times 10, or mass in kilograms times 10 gives us the um, weight of the object in, in newtons. And if I multiply that by the height over which I've raised it, that becomes the quantity of potential energy, which will also have units of joules. Um, and, and that's exactly what we have. Now, if we release that object and let and, and 
from uh, outside a building or at the top of the t tower or or what have you that and we release that it will acquire kinetic energy as it falls and the kinetic energy that it acquires will be exactly the same as the potential energy that it lost which in this case is mgh mass times acceleration due to gravity times the height uh, at the uh, just before it it touches the ground or the level the the height from which it was originally set so we can quantify this as we'll learn further in the next uh, uh, few couple lectures by uh, defining a quantity which we call the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy as we said was related to the velocity of the particle so in this case uh, or actually generally we can say this for uh, many types of of particles every type of massive particle whether it's a molecule or it's a bullet or it's a baseball uh, it's a, it's given by the mass of the object times the square of the velocity divided by two or we might say one half mass times velocity squared this is the quantity of energy that the particle will have when it has been dropped after being raised a distance h uh, above the ground and in this case then we can calculate what its velocity will be if we know what the potential energy was and we can solve this for the velocity of the particle uh, just prior to its impact now I'm going to let you look at the next two or th three slides uh, there's a question and answer for that I'll give 30 second pauses uh, the final slide um, called potential energy will also be one that you can study on your own and then we will resume on the following lecture uh, beginning with the slide labeled kinetic energy um, so take some time to look this over and uh, we will resume on the next lecture uh, where we uh, which would be uh, af just after slide 23